This is the site of Berat or Viratnagar near Alwar. The Buddha stupa that stands here was first built during the time of the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka. But even 500 years before Ashoka's time, this place would have been buzzing with action. This was home to the Matsya Mahajanapada that emerged as a powerful republic in the Indo-Gangetic Plains between 800 and 300 BCE. The period of the 16 great Mahajanapadas marks a time of great urbanization in these pockets and also over time laid the seeds of empire, which started from Magadh in the east. But sadly, little is known of the period before. How did these republics come into being and how did they become so powerful? The site of Berat gives us some answers. Author and historian Rima Huja is an authority on the ancient history of what we know as Rajasthan today. She weaves through decades of excavations and research and popular myths and legends to tell us the little known story of how the Matsya Mahajanapada was born and how its legacy lives on even today. Hi everyone, I'm Rima Huja. I'm a lapsed archaeologist and today I'd like to take you through a, a journey which is both a journey back in time but a journey through the longer history of a site called Berat or Viratnagar and um, even before it becomes a site of Berat which is roughly 60 kilometers from Jaipur and about 100 and 40 miles from Delhi. Let's uh, think of what the site was. So early stone tools have been found in this area which is now part of modern day Rajasthan's Jaipur district but it is bordering Alwar district. So we have a lot of stone tools. We also have uh, rich copper mines which were not used so much in this very early part of history but are certainly being used. They are being used even during the period of Akbar because there is a reference in the ayn e akbari to local copper and even iron and they, of course the two require different types of source material but very obviously the area is rich in it. Now geographically if you visit Alwar or if you are driving up to Jaipur uh, you find that there are there, it's a rolling um, area there are low hills and then there are steep hills because it is part of the Aravlis. What you might also notice is that there are not that many trees but maybe a little more than you have in say Jaipur and certainly a lot more than in parts of Rajasthan like Jaisalmer. However, if you go far back enough in time, this would have been a thickly wooded area. So different types of uh, forest, different heights of trees and within it there would have been maybe early clearings of uh, the prehistoric people who would have been around the little rivers, around the bigger rivers, around water sources. So as I said, we have stone tools, we have um, very fine microliths, again from the same area, but not necessarily on the site. Now having said that, the excavations which were carried on in several phases at Berat also uh, brought to light stone tools. So yes, part of uh, Berat was also a very early uh, stone using site. Further into um, closer to our own time, so you know you are in a time capsule, you have gone all the way back and then we are gradually coming closer to our time but we are still far away from our own 21st century. So somewhere around 2500 BC, 3000 BC or BCE if you are a purist nowadays, this area would have had certain uh, burials which uh, are part of what you have across India, remains of humans which are put in uh, pots, urn burials, some of them. Sometimes there would have just been stones, cairns or menhirs holding it up and Carlyle in the 1860 whenever that he was going across Rajasthan found these in many places, um, Dosa near Jaipur in a different direction, Berat. So the, the long archaeological history 
goes back to a pre-literate phase. And then if you think about it, so there is almost this myth part and then there is a history part. And in the history, there is a prehistory part. I don't want to focus too much more on the prehistory, but uh, there is enough literature to keep people fascinated. So if we move a little closer to our own times, one of the myths is that very early groups known in the Vedic uh, age included a group known as the Matsya people. The Matsya which were ruled by various kings. An early capital of the Matsya people was a place called Upaplavya, which does not seem to be Berat. So it's just this uh, reference to the Matsya and a different kingdom is to give an idea of how over time areas are popular, you might need to move for various reasons. Maybe, and this is a big maybe, the kingdom splinters. Maybe they find it's difficult to protect against whoever the local enemy is. Or maybe they find a better area that they have conquered. So for whatever reason, eventually Berat becomes a capital of the Matsya people. Now, within the mythology, we also have the early mythology. There is a reference in the Rig Veda to of the very famous king Sudas and there's a confederacy that fights him. Now the, in that, the Matsya and their twin republic uh, or their twin group of the Shalvas, Shalva people are mentioned. Uh, they are not on the winning side and eventually they get occupied. Maybe this is a period where there is movement. Now there does seem to be, from what we know, this period would be the time when early Copper, of course, is there, but early iron seems to be coming in. So we have an iron-using group. Iron is precious. You look for where iron is. You maybe settle where iron is. You certainly hold on to the iron tools you have. You have a lot more copper tools. And this also seems to be a time when forests are being cleared to make habitations, when new routes are being sought through different terrain. And possibly this is a movement which is coming in from the Punjab area um, to the northwest of Rajasthan, towards Rajasthan, towards the uh, Yam Yamuna Ganga Doab, towards the area that we talk about much more in a later phase as part of the uh, well-known Mahajanpads of the Buddha's period. But if we are in the pre-Buddhist uh, and pre-Mahavir Swami period, then this is a time where exciting movements that we know very little about but that are hinted at in the Vedic literature are taking place and our Matsya people, wherever their initial thing is, it, it seems that they were even parts of the lower foothills of the, the Himalayan range, seem to be moving towards Rajasthan. They may not even be fully Rajasthan based. Now, later, by the time that the, the Matsya kingdom gets talked about. Again, the Matsya overlordship is being discussed in relationship with the Shalvas. Sometimes they say that wherever the Shalvas were moving from, they eventually settled in the Alvar area and Alvar is from Shalvapura and Shalvapuram. So, uh, is it a parallel name? Are the Matsyas and the Shalvas the same? Well, if they are the same, why are they using two different names? But they could be because very often names are taken either from um, an ancestor or from a deity that you are following or from a place of habitation or from a totem. In this case, this emphasis on matsya, which is one of the words used in Sanskrit for fish. And incidentally, mean is another word uh, for fish, which is today's Meenas, maybe. Definitely in the south, the Meenakshi temple, so the goddess with the, the eyes like a fish. So that connection of Meen, Matsya, fish, uh, later on becomes used by people to perhaps indicate the Matsya avatar of Vishnu. So where does the name Matsya come from? Why do they have this name? And once the name comes, it sticks. So when I say it sticks, if we think of you know several hundred centuries uh, uh, before the common era, 
if we think of say about a thousand BCE, I'm not even going into mythology, I'm going into kind of much more uh, 8th century BCE, a time when they're definitely linking Bairat, Viratnagar and the capital of Matsya with this area. What's fascinating is that in 1947, when the 19 states and two chief shams of what is today Rajasthan signed the treaty of accession to the new independent India, soon after, within a year, some of them came together uh, as a viable unit. Now, this is a totally different aspect of modern India where modern states are being built. But they come together under the umbrella of the Matsya um, unit. So this name has carried on. A lot of modern day Minas try and look for their ancestry in this Matsya kingdom. They say that Matsya was their kingdom. Now, when it comes to so many aspects of India, we don't have all the evidence, but this strong linkage is there. They also will not eat fish or traditionally they did not. So again, where would you have a group which has a totem of a fish or is it meaning something else? So who the Matsya are? One myth, uh, mythology part or one myth in it says, which brings us again, it is pre um, the great republics, pre the Janpada period. But it says that Satyavati, who is this girl born in a fishing family and she eventually becomes the queen of the Kuru kingdom. She eventually becomes the queen mother and is linked to the whole Mahabharat story. That queen Satyavati, as a simple ordinary citizen, had a twin brother and he is the progenitor of the Matsya kingdom. Now, there that fish part might make some sort of sense. But again, are they just trying to ascribe um, a longer genealogy to a group, you know, linking it with a well-known mythological, classical Indian a group that is kind of pan-Indian, anyone's guess. Mine is that possibly this is a period of movement, they are coming in from some area. If the Rig Veda talks about them, then the area is much more to the northwest of present-day um, Rajasthan. And eventually, possibly one branch of the Matsya people settles here. Because again, from later sources we know that they say that during the time of um, the Magadh king, um, one of the Nanda kings, who occupies a lot of the smaller republics and makes his own empire, groups are being wiped out. Groups being wiped out means early history gets wiped out. So some of this early history, which is not written down, then becomes mythology and then becomes speculation. Our knowledge of the ancient history of the Indian subcontinent has many big gaps. For instance, we know little of what happened as the Harappan civilization declined and the time of the Mahajanapadas. For instance, latest research indicates that the cataclysmic natural or environmental disaster that led to the collapse of the Harappan cities as rivers changed course also led to a movement of people east and south, with new settlements emerging. The Rig Veda, the earliest of the Vedic texts, talks of clan wars and the later Vedas and Puranic literature adds layers and layers of bardic tradition, myths and legends to weave the story of the period when the republics rose. If we look at a map of uh, the Janpadas as they emerge, and most of the knowledge about the Mahajanpads or the great Indian republics and, and monarchies, is based on the Jain and the Buddhist and to some extent uh, hearsay and later literature. So that some kingdoms are further to the south, one or two might be to the east, but the majority of them seem to be in the uh, Gangetic, in the Yamuna Valley, in the Indo-Gangetic Valley. And in that context, the Matsya kingdom that we talk about and associate with uh, the kingdom of, uh, you know, much kingdom, but the city of Bairat or the capital of Viratnagar is definitely around the Yamuna area. It's skirting around where you have the Kurus, the Panchals, 
uh, what is happening. On the other hand, it's not that far from uh, Mathura. In fact, Alwar and Bharatpur, modern day Alwar and Bharatpur districts, and before that, the kingdoms, were are fringing uh, Mathura. So if there's a capital, the, the Yadu kingdom would have been near neighbors of the Matsyas. And that is, a, again, a story that comes up in the legends of the Mahabharata. So this is actually pretty kind of centrally located. Uh, there seems to be trade that is happening and more of that later because some of those coins are found in a later period. So this is possibly not so much on the fringes as the as just looking at the site might make people think. You know, you look at the site which we do come to and wonder who would make a monastery here? Why does someone want to come to this way out place? Was it way out back then? It's very close to Mathura which means it's very close to events that are happening in Mathura, whether they are of the Mahabharata period, whether they are of a later period, whether they're even of an earlier period that we know very little about, but where forests are being cut. So Mathura is founded when the one of Madhu, the demon Asur, is chopped down and a city is built. You know, there, there are these layers which talk of an urbanization phase that is happening. And that urbanization seems to be something that would make the Berat kingdom also have a, have a capital, this large capital, the Matsya kingdom, the names become interchangeable even now. People talk of the kingdom of Jaipur when they meant Dundar. Uh, they talked of Alwar where of course the name is the same. But even in the past, names are interchangeable. The kings are often na named for the kingdom they control and that seems to be happening here also. I wish we could do more work and find out what is happening because unlike a lot of sites in uh, say the, the Panipat, Sonipat, all of this area which have got heavily built up over the centuries over and over and over again, uh, some of the sites like around Berat have not been that heavily built upon till the 20th century. The, the vital point is the 20th century. So uh, excavation, which has happened, but more excavation and even field work can probably give us a lot more information. The archaeological site of Berat with its spectacular stupa, which was built much later during the Mauryan period, hides many a secret. Excavations have helped us imagine what it would have been like but it is through myths, especially references in the Mahabharata, that the most colourful accounts of Berat come. In fact, the Matsyas play a crucial role as the capital of King Berat, where the, the five Pandav brothers and Draupadi, the wife, come and stay. They spend, apparently, they spent a whole year of their, the year that they had to spend incognito because if they were discovered in that 13th year of exile. So just to refresh um, uh, any of our viewers who may not be that clued in at this point, uh, in the story of the Mahabharata, at one point, the heroes are asked to go into exile for 12 years. And at the end of the 12th year, there is a kind of a, a, a cheat clause and they raise the thing and say, you have to spend another year in exile. But this time, if somebody discovers who you are, then you have to go back into exile for uh, 12 more years. So, again, let's think of the geography. Berat, Viratnagar, Matsya is close enough and yet it's not controlled by the Kurus or the Panchals or any of the other kingdoms. And that is where the story says the five Pandav brothers and Draupadi come in spend their year in exile. In fact, they've hidden their weapons because they can't be carrying their weapons on a, in a Shami tree on Berat um, or Matsya kingdom property somewhere over there. So, uh, you know, looking at the longer history of uh, Berat and looking at what archaeology can tell us, there have been excavations in many areas, but at one point, many areas across India, I mean, but at one point, some excavations were being done for specific reasons. So one which is closer to our time was 1962 
when Mr. Banerjee from the Archaeological Survey of India and his team came to work on the site of Bairat, which was already known for its monastery, which had been excavated, and for some of the Mauryan period remains, which had been excavated. So I'm kind of going back and forth in time just to bring you to this fact that during the 1962 excavation, which took place at a different location, so that they could see the extent of old Bairat, and they could see what else was available. He went through several layers and came across pottery which went back to the painted greyware period, which again is sort of pre-Janpad but around that time, but it's early pottery. It's a pottery associated with early iron across India. Um, it's pretty actually very good to look at. It's very light in weight. The shapes are flattish bottom, uh, with with a side so it would be something you could easily eat uh, pasta or soup out of it's so lightweight when you touch it it's almost like um, it doesn't feel like porcelain but it's as light as porcelain it's as light as all these synthetic melamines and stuff which had come in and the surface is usually a sort of a slate gray painted often with black um, sometimes with very rarely white, reds, other shades of um, uh, red, white, black and the designs on it would be three to five vertical lines, circles, horizontal lines, that, that whole, um, uh, that pottery has been found. So as I said, this area has had very early stone tools, this area has had early megalithic and other burial. This area has copper mines. This area seems to have evidence pointing to the very early part when these little kingdoms are being set up and we know too little about them and they are still not maybe strong enough to be counted as a Janpad. Now I want to stay with the word Janpad for a minute because I, and I don't mean the etymology. I don't mean you know that these are the great Jan, the people and the republics or the kingdoms in that sense. But for Matsya to be counted as a great kingdom or a great republic and one of the 16 of India and the number changes if you look at some of the Buddhist literature, the Anguttar Nikai has a certain listing, uh, others have a different listing. Matsya is constant in all of them. So Matsya crucially located geographically linked with mythological um, happenings, seems to be in the right place where you have uh, copper and later iron. And I must mention here that one of the few iron smelting and manufacturing sites excavated in India of this period, of this early painted greyware period, is not far from uh, the kingdom of, Be of the capital of Bairat. It's a site called Jodhpura, which was excavated by the State Department of Archaeology of Rajasthan. Um, and uh, of course, like with, arch with archaeological sites, you have to cover it up because it gets ruined. But the drawings are there of the bellows, uh, of what remains of the bellows of the kiln. So again, they're making iron. Is this one of the things which gives the Matsya kingdom its strength? Is it the location? Is it the proximity to the larger Indo-Gangetic kingdom? So are we seeing a phase where from a small habitation, somebody becomes a larger capital kingdom, ca capital city, and that means traders come in? By the 5th century BCE, the focus of attention shifts east along the Indo-Gangetic plains as Magadh grows in strength. But this was after a period of struggle when ambition drove the Mahajanapadas to transform. The big swallowed the weak. Sadly, we know little of the Matsyans during this period. Now in all this, we don't really know much about the political situation uh, of the Matsya kingdom. In fact, we know very little about the daily lives of the average Matsya dweller, let alone the Berat capital dweller. We also don't know what the relationship with many of their contemporary kingdoms would have been or with their contemporary um, republics would have been 
other than the few that are already being referred to. For example, we don't know if they had any relationship at all with Magd. Now, it doesn't seem improbable because people traveled a lot and uh, the, the uh, iron from Magd was probably being used in parts of the Gangetic Valley. The iron and copper from Matsik could have been traded in many other places. But this certainly does not seem to be evidence for any direct link. There is evidence for direct link with, obviously, with kingdoms which are bordering the Matsik area. Now, what happens when, on the one hand, certain kingdoms like Avanti start occupying their neighbors, when Magd starts occupying Koshal and Kashi and, you know, there, it's little fish being swallowed up by big fish. To an extent, perhaps the Matsya people are able to retain a form of independence, more than a form, they, are, they remain a republic, uh, because of their geographic location. It's a bit like in later history, much, much later history, uh, the Mayos of that area have maintained um, their own way of life and their own way of asserting their identity despite the Delhi Sultanate sending troops against them, despite the Mughal sending troops against them. So this area, they are able to retain their own hold in their own way. What is interesting, of course, is that when uh, Cunningham and... Uh, now, so when I say Cunningham, just casually like he's my best friend, he's not. <laughs> but he's, he's the man who set up the Sur Archaeological Survey of India and... Uh, 1857 and prior to that is the period that he's taking these surveys across India. He had found evidence at Harappa, which he writes about, of a culture which now we know is the Harappan culture. He found the site of Berat had a lot of very intriguing material, so he noted it. And he also talks about the very large and sprawling, and let me just look at my screen for a minute. Um, he says that the surrounding fields were covered with broken pottery and flag fragments of metal slag from ancient copper works. Cunningham also had surmised that there were the remains of a very large religious establishment here. Now, Alexander Cunningham's work was not to go around excavating. He was actually a military officer uh, turned dilettante archaeologist. So he did not, but he rightly found that the area had potential. Cunningham, who found early evidence of um, stone um, pot burials and uh, megalithic burials in the Rajasthan area, found again that there were a lot of brick baths and pottery. And so again, the evidence seems to be that Matsya kingdom and its capital remained important as we move through time closer to our own period. Travel to the site of Berat or Viratnagar and what you'll find here is a stupa by Ashoka. There is evidence to show that the emperor even lived here. Part of the importance of Berat would have been its location, close to important centres like Mathura and the Uttarapat, the cardinal trade route linking Takshila to the ports of Bengal. There is a excavated um, monastery and an excavated stupa here and there is part evidence that Ashoka uh, gave arms to this uh, site and he probably visited it in his 13th year of, uh, of his reign. What have we found? Again, excavations by uh, Dayaram Sahani found that there had once been a wooden stupa or a, or a temple at that site. There was evidence of um, the reliquary which would have had some gold in it. That was also found. Most of it was found in fragments. Dharam Sani, by the way, uh, working in Rajasthan, I tend to forget, he was a member of the Archaeological Survey of India, that he had also excavated at, uh, or he had studied and worked at and excavated at what is now known for the Rampurva um, Ashokan Edict. So he would definitely recognize his Ashokan or his Mauryan edicts and his Mauryan pillars and his Mauryan uh, statuary when he found it. So it seems to us, QED, that Berat is a site where the monastery, 
the temple, the stupa, when I say temple, the round shrine, gets imperial patronage. There, there is in the remnants that uh, Dai Ram Sani f found and he uh, speculated that uh, despite people saying that some of this was destroyed by one of the sultans or by one of the Mughal rulers, he says the evidence is so far down in the earth that this destruction would have taken place nearer Ashoka's own time period and that is what has preserved some of this beneath the ground. He thinks it was done by the Huns. But before I make that sort of a jump, remains on a high hill, local hill, now known as Bijak Ki Pahari, found that there was the Ashokan edict on it and there were remains of brick built, uh, fire brick built monasteries. So you have Buddhist monks here. We have a round circular shrine that initially was made of uh, wood and brick and later on it was covered uh, with uh, uh, stone and within it were the relics. Now that over time has been lost to us but the remains are available and that means that the reliquary that would have had something from the past which was linking it to the Buddha is also lost to us. It is significant to have a relic at Berat. That means Berat has a value in the Mauryan Empire. It has value in the eyes of um, Ashok. And before I go on to the edict, now the, the Bhaburu Berat rock edict, as it is better known, is um, now part of the Asiatic Society of Kolkata's collection and has been exhibited and is Interestingly, that Bhabru where it was found is um, 12 miles north of modern day Berat. And so it has been again speculated as early as when it was found by Sahani that this seems to have been moved from its original location. But anyway, let me just read a little bit on what uh, Ashok had put on this particular edict. He says, His Grace the King of Magadha addresses the Sangh with greetings and bids its members prosperity and good health. You know, reverend sirs, how far extends my respect for and faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. Whatsoever, reverend sirs, has been said by the venerable Buddha, all that has been well said. However, reverend sirs, if on my own account, I may point out a particular text, I venture to this one. So he's referring to the Buddhist text, but he is making his point of what he's put there. And this is inscribed. Thus the good law will endure. One, the exaltation of discipline. Vine Samukkase. Second, he points to the course of conduct of the great saints. Then he talks to the fears of what might happen. Then he talks about the song of the hermit, the Munigatha. Then he talks about the dialogue on the hermit's life. Then he talks about the address to Rahul, beginning with the subject of falsehood, which the Buddha himself spoke. So he says then, he, I go back to uh, citing from this, that these reverend sirs, I desire that many monks and nuns should frequently hear and meditate and that likewise the laity, male and female, should do the same. For this reason, reverend sirs, I cause this edict to be written so that people may know my intentions. It has been suggested that, and this is by uh, very early on, that Ashok may have sent, spent a whole rainy season, a Chaturmas, four months of the rain, at the monastery in Berat, and this could have been in the 13th year of his reign, at which point both the texts that we talk about and the other one was um, inscribed. Now, most of the other remains that are found here, they're using rocks, uh, local stone, but they're also using marble. And uh, excavator Dairam Sahani found that, you know, there were these solid but beautifully carved uh, pieces, which he thought were the feet of a lion. 
And I've, I've spoken elsewhere of how Dharam Sarni certainly literally knew his marbles because he had worked on the Rampurva sites and he knew his Buddhist, uh, his Buddhist Ashokan material. So, intriguing. We have more evidence of the importance of this site. We have the monastery at this site. We have the stupa at this site. We have evidence all around of bits of the stupa lying there. We also have something else that I need to uh, talk about before I forget it completely. So in the local hills around uh, Berat city, there are lots of the caves. And in those caves, some of them have inscriptions which are in the Brahmi script, but slightly variant, uh, variant of it, which locally is known as the Shankalipi, the conch shell writing. A uh, lot of local people would say this is a secret writing. Well, whether it was a secret writing or not, again it seems to indicate that with the water available, with the, the monastery available, with the uh, stupa available, this is a place that keeps its importance as a Buddhist center for a very long time. Very briefly, along with this Shanklipi that people could not read, so they called it Shanklipi, the term Bijak ki Pahari on which um, the edict has been found, it basically Bijak is a term used locally for, uh, or in many places, for a treasure map. So they, the, uh, the people who came post the inscription, post the modern period, basically thought of this as some sort of a secret writing that could tell you where vast treasure was buried. Again, inscriptions, writings, people, monastery, something is happening which emphasized the importance of Berat over the ages. There are many local stories about hidden treasures here at the Bijakki Pahari or the Hill of Treasures and the old relics that this monastery once housed are long gone. But this site and the area around are repositories of priceless treasures within that tell the story of how a settlement rose and evolved over millennia, helping us make sense of the great gaps in the understanding of India's ancient past. Interestingly, echoes of that past continue to be heard today. Join Reema Huja for a live session as she takes us through her work on the early history of Berat and Rajasthan and tells us how it connects to today.